Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your recap episode for this week's American Express. And joining me, to break it all down, Mark Immelman is here. Mark, good to have you. It's nice to be here. My goodness, it's chilly when the sun goes down. Oh, wowza. I'm keen to see what it's like in uh, San Diego and Pebble Beach in a couple of weeks time. Good golly. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get much sympathy from our, you know, Northeastern uh, listeners. Maybe Very you, Greg, maybe you, Greg Deshar, who joins us as well. I don't think uh, you want to hear too much about Mark being a bit, a bit chilly when the sun goes well, down. Well, well, well Greg, it was nice today. Yeah. Well, Go well, ahead, well Greg, forgive me because, you know, you and I were wrapping the other evening and I was like, no, it was like, 40 degrees or 38 degrees and i was like there's no chance i'm giving golf lessons here's me sitting in a scarf and stuff and you're in the northeast and you look like you're about to go outside well today was one of those days i kind of felt like i could play i mean it was really nice out not that i got outside very much but we have had a brutal cold streak of late um i mean you're talking single digits it's been bitter but just you know december and and today wasn't bad at all um not quite golf weather close it was close today. So, yeah, nice, but I don't I don't feel for you. I have no sympathy, Mark. <laughs> Love you, man. <laughs> tough, 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 tough. Well, gentlemen, we had ourselves a heck of a final round, and we're obviously going to go through the winner. We're going to talk about the notables at the top. But, Mark, we were talking about this earlier in the week with the way that the leaderboard was shaping up, especially heading into Sunday. We knew this was going to be a big moment for somebody. There were a lot of guys in the top 10 who did not have a PGA Tour victory. There were a couple of rookies out there. It was going to be a big moment for somebody. Yeah, and and for the longest time, obviously, Lee Hodges was playing beautifully and Paul Barjan. You know, I, I watched him play as an amateur in the Spirit Invitational down in Houston a few years ago. It's an international event. and He represented France. And at that stage, he was at TCU. And he turned my head some because he's powerful. And, and I was like, you know, I don't think he's going to back down very much. But I still thought after yesterday, um, Tom Hoagie was sort of the pick of the litter for me, just the way he was playing. And, and he's been there, and this was his 201st start, and obviously there's experience and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, th I thought that would probably be his turn. But, heck, all sorts of credit to some of the chasers. I mean, both the boys there, Brian Harmon, we had him in our feature groups coverage for a while, and he was playing alongside John Rahm. And, you know, he looked sort of okay, but didn't really look too convincing. Then all of a sudden, just turned up the gas there around the turn and, and and then had a fast finish. And then, of course, Hudson Swafford doing business there was cool. For me, For me, the intriguing story, apart from Hudson, who looked great, was Francesco Molinari. I mean, this is a guy who's had dismal form for a few years, um, missed more cuts than he made in 2020, barely played in the fall. I think he's he played three times and only made the cut once and finished. We might have lost them. Mark is on hotel internet, Greg. So we'll 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 continue here and see if we can get him yeah, back. But we can cut I him think, a break. I think that this was this was like a NASCAR race, right? I mean, it was Seamus Power, who was the best player near the top. He immediately goes out and struggles out of the gate. Everyone is moving around. You're wondering if Lee Hodges can hold on. I mean, it it was just an absolute logjam. It, it all day. I mean, you had there was one point where Cantlay was two back or three back. And he was in tied ninth. I mean, it, it, yeah. one, one the difference between one shot out there, if you were near the top in that, you know, at that 20 under mark for a while, it was a big difference. You made a bogey. You fall way down the leaderboard. You fall off the first page. So I, I absolutely agree. It was a complete log jam. And I'm very surprised it didn't go to a playoff. This thing had mm -hmm. playoff written all over it for quite a while. Well, our winner... Harris English, no, no, not Harris English. Hudson Swafford <laughs> gets it done with a Sunday 64, and he too uh, struggled out of the gate. Mark, he makes a bogey on one, but he fights back. He makes the turn at three under, and then that's when he got hot. His back nine featured exactly one par because he went birdie, 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 bogey, birdie, bogey, eagle, birdie, par on 18 that's good enough for victory rick i want to for the folks listening I, I and watching i want to recount a story that you and i shared together a last fall in vegas when we were out there in the practice rounds for the cj cup and um you know we were there i think it was 14 or whatever it was in the par five and i said to you 
hey, wait here, let's watch these guys hit because this is Keith Mitchell and, and, and Hudson Swafford. And they came on the green and they both laid back characters, the two of them. And, and then we walked up to the next tee. It was that par five. I think it's 15 maybe or 14. And you and I were right off the edge of the tee. And I've seen Hudson and Keith both play. And they're both such impressive strikers. Um, funny, the stats don't necessarily show that. And Hudson got up there and just laced one. And I looked at you and you sort of looked at me, didn't say very much, and you raised your eyebrows. And I'm like, yeah, this is who this guy is. And then we were talking to him and he said, I've been playing so well for so long, man. I've just got to find a way to somehow make some putts. <laughs> Lo and behold, he made some putts in the back nine and uh, he shot himself just a million under par there. Yeah, he certainly did that. I remember that moment. It sounds different when guys like Hudson Swafford hit it and also when you shake his hand and it just, you know, he just dwarfs you with his hand. It's unbelievable stuff. So uh, kudos to to Hudson Swafford. I'm stoked he was able to close this one out. And, and Greg, you know, it, this is – uh, maybe a continuation of these good vibes for these Georgia Bulldogs. There, there seems to be a lot of Georgia Bulldogs having success. Obviously, they win the national championship. Russell Henley was in the mix uh, last week. Matt Stafford has himself a day on Sunday. Now Hudson Swafford adds to the list. I mean, this is good times rolling here. It, very good times. It's good to be a Bulldog <laughs> right now. I mean, poor um, poor Russell Henley was is like the letdown of the group. For any, any, all he did is contend on – the weekend he had a five shot lead going into the last nine for his chance to win. So very, very interesting uh, dynamic there. But what I find so interesting about Hudson is this, this run that he's been on and what he says, he talks about how, as Mark just alluded to how well he's been playing yet coming into this event, it's a tied 48th, the cut tied 35th, tied 33rd at my tied 32nd. It's like, he's so close, but it just wasn't quite happening. He wasn't quite popping. Um, I, and I had a little feeling he, he could pop this week. It, it seems like a good golf course for him. And he, and he did get the putter rolling. He was second in strokes game putting yesterday on the stadium course. And again today and, and second for the week. Uh, of course, those are all those numbers are only stadium course, but right. he, he got it rolling with the putter for sure. What I find so interesting, Mark, is I was trying to find the highlight. Usually when you get a winner on Sunday, there's a moment. I I think I have three different moments for Hudson Swafford on, on Sunday. The the approach that he hit onto 16, that's the par five. I believe it was a uh, six iron that he just threw up high in the air, 200 yards, lands it nice and soft. He rolls that in for eagle. Then he makes a, a, a putt on 17 for birdie. That was kind of him closing the door on everybody else. And just when you thought things were maybe opening up a bit for Tom Hoagie. He makes a clutch putt on 18. I mean, I thought there were three real highlights over the final three holes and Hudson Swafford came up big in all three. Yeah, there were. And to be completely honest with you guys, obviously with us on feature groups coverage, we had a, had a monitor, so I couldn't see everything. But I remember it was earlier in the back nine, um, might have been 12 or one of those holes maybe before then. No, it was 10. He had hit it on the back of 10, and he had like 40 feet down the hill or whatever it was. And I look at my announced colleague, John Swantek, and I was like, you know, this guy is so good. He's just got to make some putts. And then he rolls in that putt over there, and it goes in just at perfect speed and drips in on the final roll. And I look at Swantek, and he looks back at me, and he goes, well, maybe today's the day. And, and, and for me, that sort of set off the whole chain of dominoes. Now, there were a few missteps, obviously, with the bogeys on the backside. And those putts and those saves that you reference over the final few holes were big. But that putt there that he boxed on 10 from outside of 40 feet or whatever it was, I feel like that was huge for the cause because it sort of gets you into the position to do the other special stuff. Perhaps if he doesn't make that long one, then it's a different story entirely. 45 and, feet, 3 inches was that putt, Greg. Yeah, which was sweet. It was just sweet. But the, the one that I'd add to it, another highlight that I think will get overlooked because it was sandwiched between the two bogeys, but the uh, the the putt on 14 was yeah. also a huge putt. And that's kind of outside of that range where you expect him to make it. And he's just coming off a of bogey on 13. And it, you feel like he's letting guys back in the event and where it looks like he's going to separate himself. Then all of a sudden he lets everybody back in and then, um, and then he makes that putt and it, it kind of put a 
stamp on it. And then he makes a bogey and then an eagle. So <laughs> 14 and 16 were both those that they, they were both bounce backs that I think were really, really, really important for him in a in a log jam event like this. I'll, I'll bounce this right back to you, Greg, because you and I talked about this all week long. Hudson Swafford entered this, entered this week at 200 to 1. 200 to 1 to win this event. To remind uh, people here, uh, Siwoo Kim won it last year at 60 to 1. Andrew Landry in 2020 at 200 to 1. And Adam Long the year prior at 500 to 1. This continues to be an event that allows these longer shots to actually go out and win much more frequently than some of the other PGA tour stops that we have. Which is quite interesting. I think it has a lot to do with the golf course setup, the way the golf course is designed, uh, the designer of the golf course and Pete Dye, at least the stadium course, and the fact that there's three golf courses. So it, it, and, and they're not the most difficult on the PGA tour. So it, it brings a lot of guys into play because length isn't a prere prerequisite. Um, and, and if you heard John Rahm's frustration, I know we're going to talk about that a little later, but John Rahm's frustration of calling it an easy setup and a putting contest allows, it opens up the field to everybody. Whereas what you'll see next week is um, a, a golf course that separates a little more. It, it determines, it, it separates the different skill levels a little bit more. This doesn't take anything away from any of the players near the top. It's It doesn't necessarily make it easier to win. It might make it harder to win. Um, so could, because it brings everybody back in the mix. But I do think that's part of the reason why you're seeing the long shots win as often as they do. And the the when you get below the John Rahm kind of level of player, that that top tier, the top 15 guys, everybody seem everybody else seems to be very comparable in their skill level. They may excel in different areas. Some are better ball strikers, some are better putters, some are but their ability to score is quite similar. And you that gets highlighted in an event like this where the top tier, there's not a lot of top tier guys playing, one and two. The, the golf course setup doesn't it doesn't differentiate between all of those players. And again, really important aspect of this. That doesn't make it easier to win. It, it might make it harder to win. Hey, Rick, I well, want to add to that real fast too. The one thing that we saw here at this event that we haven't necessarily seen in years past because ordinarily the weather is just perfect there. And no matter which golf course you're at, um, La Quinta or the Nicholas Tournament course or the stadium course, you'll typically see the same performances. La Quinta is sort of the easiest. Nicholas Tournament's the next easiest. And then the stadium field, stroke average-wise, is the hardest. But with that weather that rumbled in on, uh, oh, shucks, I can't remember, Friday evening, you know, the last couple hours of play made the Nicholas Tournament course play the hardest of the three, which was out of the ordinary. And and then we had some some sort of winds a little bit Saturday. and And so... The weather was completely out of the ordinary. And for the first time ever since I've been at this event, which has been a few years now, um, I, I saw a real advantage to playing the golf courses in a certain rotation. And, and, and the folks, I think it was, that started on the stadium course, they had the distinct advantage. And a lot of the guys at top, the top of the leaderboard were in that rotation. So, look, you can't guarantee it that way. And with three different golf courses, you're going to have this sort of thing. But for the first time in my memory, certainly, you, I've seen a situation where there was an advantage to play a certain course at a certain time over the first three rounds. Mm. Hudson Swafford captures his third career PGA Tour victory, his second win at this event, adding himself to a list that it's pretty strong. I'll, I'll read you the multiple winners of the American Express. Obviously, this has gone back and changed names about 15 times. But Arnold Palmer, Billy Casper, Johnny Miller, uh, more recent, more recently, Phil Mickelson, Bill Haas. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty decent little list. Corey Pavin's on it as well. So uh, kudos to you, Hudson Swafford. You are back in the winner's circle. But we talked about the log jam, Greg, and it could have been Brian Harmon trying to sneak up and steal this with a with a Sunday 64. Lonto Griffin holes out for Eagle on 12, and you're thinking maybe this is his moment, and you're getting uh, Will Zalatoris charging at times. I mean, get what stood out to you about someone or something in this chase pack? I think um, a couple of things. The guys – Again, when you're watching this on the broadcast, this really stands out to me. 
um, there are guys that you don't even see. You don't see their names. You don't see them hit shots until they do something like Lonto did, hole one, and all of a sudden they pop up on the broadcast and they're right there in the tournament. So it's the the general number of players that are in the mix here. It really it really stood out to me. I was kind of blown away by it to be to be honest. You're talking about Patrick Cantlay in ninth place is five back um and and only two back of tied third so those that leaderboard was so jammed and it took hudson swafford to go eagle birdie sure. and then two of his last three holes to separate but aside from that i mean there were 15 guys in the mix and and, and it really jumped out to me um and and the other thing i'll say is molinari as as uh as you mentioned mark molinari popping up here and and getting himself in the mix could be, a, I mean, it could be a big statement for the game of golf because he hasn't been playing a lot. When you don't play a lot, you don't you don't have a chance to get in that rhythm, and so you're not gonna you're likely not gonna play very well. Um, but he he comes out, and I'm wondering if this year he's uh, a, a, the old Molinari, which can be scary for the competitors. Rick, I'd like to put a bow on Cantley real fast, and obviously Molinari shooting three sixty sevens and a sixty eight. That was awesome to see him start to regain some form. Um, but Cantley, we covered him a lot, and he had nothing. I mean, uh, that that 60, whatever he was, that uh, 62, I think, in day one where he was tied for the lead, that was at La Quinta. It's the kind of golf course you can not fake it around, but you can hit less than driver off certain tees and put the ball in play, and, and the greens were just perfect there. I mean, they were like billiard tables. So um, it, it was easier to get on a, on a calm day. But the rest of the rounds we had him in our coverage, he just didn't have very much at all. And still to find a way to shoot the scores that he did speaks to kind of the player that he's become, in my opinion, because a real consistent tournament winner will find a way to get in the mix even though they don't have their best game. You've heard the old Tiger Woods thing. You know, I didn't have my A game. I was competing with my C game, whatever. Well, Candler had his C, he had his rear end game. And he still found a way to get himself to whatever it was deep under par and and make himself a factor still. So I think that bodes really well for him and, and and the future. Yeah, it is it is fascinating stuff. And I think the angle of the other two guys that or the two guys that were in uh, the final group, Paul Barjan and Lee Hodges, Greg, you know, the the refrain that we usually get in this moment when when a guy who might be a rookie or doesn't have a lot of winning or any winning experience and they are in it, but they don't win is we say, oh, it's good experience. It's good to have them in the heat of the battle. I'm not sure they necessarily feel that way, but we're going to see how those guys respond and play moving forward. Well, it's a huge deal for especially if you look at a, a Lee Hodges, a tied third. Um, and the same is true for Paul Barjan, but but you you finish tied third in an event like this, it reduces a lot of pressure. You gain a lot of FedEx Cup points uh, for with one finish like that. And the way the FedEx Cup point structure is, uh, the or the the points are structured, when you have really high finishes, it, it values being a popper, right? Having yeah. it, it's better to come in third one week, miss the cut the next week, come in fourth another week, and 56 another, rather than tied 25th throughout the season. You, you want to have those high finishes because the points jump up in, in bunches. So that's a big relief for him. I, I'm, it, it, but I'm sure he's at the same time very disappointed that he didn't close the deal in a tournament he felt like he could have won because now you're talking about the difference between still worrying about your job for the rest of the year and not worrying about your job for two years and and that, that's a huge difference but all in all i think i think he and paul barjan and most of the guys up near the top take away a lot of confidence out of the week those guys even though they had a misstep on the final day the con the confidence will be soaring on the way out there especially hodges i mean barjan didn't play very well but there's something be before we even get to the playoffs in the fedex cup i mean barjan i think finished tied 10th so that's an automatic invitation into next week I'm not sure if he was exempt into the field. So that's a big deal. And then remember, they've got the Corn Ferry Tour reshuffle that's coming up here uh, soon. And, and and to get yourself inside that reshuffle so you can plan the rest of the year uh, in, in your category is a big, big deal. So for these guys having big finishes early, it goes a whole lot farther, further than, uh, than just more money in the bank account and some FedEx Cup points. 
being able to guarantee and plan your schedule because you've situated yourself in the reshuffle, not sure exactly when it is. It's a huge deal for the the KFT graduates. It's a great point, Mark. It's kind yeah, of a, really it, it's is. almost like winning, right? It's like a shorter, mm -hmm. you win, you know, you have two years where you, you're there in the schedule, but you get yourself a, a certain number of starts for the reshuffle. It's a, it's a much yeah. smaller scale of that, but you, you're right. You can, you can plan things out for that little bit of time. John Rahm finished T14, 67, 71 on the weekend, and he lipped out a lot. He was very frustrated on the putting greens, and he voiced some of that frustration that was picked up by a fan and their mobile phone. Jacob, I imagine we don't have the audio for this because I imagine we can't play the audio for this, right? Yeah, I tried to uh, do a little <laughs> editing. But uh, it's too much pretty, to edit, us. <laughs> it pretty much just made it one big bleep. Yeah, it made it useless. Well, uh, he fires some expletives, uh, but in short, here, Mark, he's he's upset about the setup and he thinks that it was a putting contest, and that might not necessarily be what he liked. Uh, and he voiced that as he was walking from green to tee. It's just a PGA Tour player venting because he's one year before and he's the guy who entered the field. You know, he didn't have to come and play the week prior to Torrey Pines, which is like a guaranteed a happy hunting ground for him. Uh, he's just got to be a bit careful because I get uh, because Ram has been caught on microphone, a live hot mic before. Um, but now to have a fan catching you out and then that video, that video to almost go viral, I think. I don't know how many times it's been seen. That fine, which is normally a few thousand, is going to turn into double digits thousand. So it's going to cost him a little bit. And 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 just sort of be a gentle reminder that he's going to have to be a little bit more careful because there's always a hot mic. There are always people listening. And at his place in the game, the world's number one player, he defines his destiny. He defines who he is. And then he's got people and golfers and young kids and all that sort of stuff looking at him, uh, up at him. So... You got to be a little careful. Uh, if if you're walking in between the fans, you don't go popping off like that. You you, you keep your mouth shut. You bite your tongue. Yes, I know you're thinking that it's a, a setup like that. Everybody knows when you go to the American Express, it's a putting contest. Get over it. Play. If you don't make putts, you're not going to win. You don't have to uh, scream and shout and cuss about it. That's my opinion. Uh, that video has been viewed 601,000 times on Twitter alone in this moment. I'm sure that'll be at a, a million by the time we wake up on uh, Monday morning. But, uh, Greg, the the thing that I think is interesting is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, the best players probably want harder setups and ones that are – more beneficial to what I guess ball strikers. It, it kind of goes back to the whole Brooks Kepka thing when you show up at a major championship and he thinks only 25 guys could win. I guess if you're one of those 25 guys, you want that every week. Yeah, you're playing in a smaller, it's a, it becomes right. a limited field event. Absolutely. Um, but again, to Mark's point, which is great, you pick your schedule. So, you know, don't go, you, you don't order. Uh, or, you know, pick out an apple at the grocery store and then get upset that it's not an orange. It's not, it's not an orange, but you, you picked it. So you're, you're right, Mark. This does, this is, uh, the same thing every year. It's the same tournament every year. And it was a putting yeah, contest man. when he won. And when you're frustrated because you're not making putts, then, yeah, it's going to be frustrating. But Rick, you're absolutely right. You go to some of the tougher venues on, on the PGA tour depending on why they're tougher, they separate players a, a little bit differently. And, you know, it's not necessarily that the score is only going to be 10 under par, right? but it's the difference between a great shot and a mediocre shot. The, the difference in the penalty um, is what really separates and your ability to recover and all that stuff. I mean, on, on this golf course, there's not a lot of rough. If you hit it out, you, you just have to avoid your major hazards and everybody's going to have a chance. So for a, a, a premier ball striker, that advantage is limited a little bit. You don't have to hit it as well as John Rom to compete with John Rom on that golf course. You, you have to putt better, which a, a lot of people did this week. Yeah. I, we, we can move on. Cause I don't think this is that big of a deal, Mark. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know it's easy for us to be like, Oh, 
John Rahm got caught on the hot mic. Let's talk about it. Now it's a thing. It is my understanding that John Rahm and Adam Hayes, his caddy, like John Rahm, he just gets it out. Like Hobie walking down the fairway, he just blows off steam for 15 yeah. seconds and they move on. Like this is this is not really uncharacteristic or I don't even think it's all that interesting to be honest with you. <laughs> Well, me too. I mean, we saw this video before we went in the air this morning and I just laughed. And when we had Andres Gonzalez, a former PGA Tour professional, he was a, a part of our relief crew coming in, the relief announcers. And he just looked at me, he goes, that'll be costly. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's sort of ended there, you know, but, but that's exactly who Ram is. He's mercurial. Uh, heck, he's worked with a bomb disposal expert to try and get him to simmer down and and to be able to deal with the emotional outbursts a little bit but you're right this is what he does he, he goes off and adam hayes just gets pummeled for about 30 seconds or so i hope he, he doesn't take it personally if he did he would have moved along it's sort of like right. greller and jordan speed to a certain extent and, and it's just the nature of the beast but you do that inside the ropes john you don't do it when you're walking outside the ropes with people and phones around you because it's not like you're some nobody on the tour. You're a big strapping dude who's the number one golfer in the world, and folks want pictures of you or videos. Most of folks take videos and videos of sound, so just be a little careful next time. Right, that that's a good point because you're always on camera, and yeah, you're, you're always, always on camera. camera, and there's always a mic around. <laughs> so, I mean, it, the the defense I give to Rom is it did seem like he was saying it under his breath. And yeah, looked, what video, cell phone was that? That that, that right. microphone was was super hot. I the technology was impressive. He was like twenty feet away under his breath, and it came out perfectly clear. I, I watched <laughs> it a couple of times. I thought it was edited. So I, it I. almost sounded like somebody took a soundbite and put it on that clip because his mouth wasn't moving, his head's down, and it. I, I couldn't believe it picked it up. Every broadcast we're ever on, folks, even if they've got us muted and we had a commercial break. And they've got the bird beater on, which is supposed to shut off all the signal into the wherever it goes. The, the producer's always like, guys, this could be going anywhere. Right. You know, and, and it's truth. I mean, even though you think you're muted, somebody somewhere can hear it. It's, it, it's you've got to be very careful in the era in which we currently live. Oh, always assume you're hot and coming in hot, Kyle Porter, KP. Welcome. He's setting up his mic. I don't know if you can hear me. That's a perfect time. Here's what we'll do. I got to get to our one and done. We'll give Kyle a chance to give his thoughts on the American Express. We've got to talk through Abu Dhabi. There's a lot to talk about, so we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. Kyle Porter, can you hear me? I got you. Got All right. You. Welcome in, KP. We have kind of put a bow on the American Express. We're going to go to our one and done, but you have not had an opportunity to – heap praise on Hudson Swafford or any of the several other dozen things that you might be able to come up with here. Well, Greg looks like Joe Buck right now with that microphone. That's, that's incredible. Um, yeah. You, you missed the debut last night. Yeah. We um, talked okay. about, we were like, we were like, yeah. Whoa, Greg, impressive stuff it, right there. Yeah. That headset. A Andrew Catalan. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> I just go down the list. Um, Jim, Nance. I was hoping for Jim Nance. <laughs> <laughs> I get crazy. Doesn't sound that yeah. good. Yeah, I, th I thought that <laughs> it was funny because I, this, I don't have a ton on on Sunday uh, other than – well, two, two things. One, I thought Hudson Swafford's par was actually emblematic – his par on 18 was actually emblematic of the rest of his back nine. It was just a complete roller coaster, and it was the only par, and it kind of was also just, yeah, like indicative of how the entire back nine went. Uh, wasn't an easy par, was it? <laughs> yeah, it was. A, you, you had to make an eight footer for par, and it, you know, I, I thought what what John Rom said that I can't retweet because it's pretty profane <laughs> about the course setup was super interesting. I don't, I don't really agree with it. I understand where he's coming from. Uh, people can go search his name on Twitter and and figure out what he said he was hey, just complaining. that video of you counts is going up now <laughs> do it oh yeah that video of you counts is going up from six hundred thousand now <laughs> it, it's it's really interesting did you guys already talk about this yeah okay so it, it's super interesting it's i thought it was a little unfair because three of the top six guys on the leaderboard were putted horribly zala i think hoagie was was pretty bad with the putter 
Now that's only two measured rounds. I don't know. There, there's a ton of different ways you could go there, but I thought that was one of the more interesting parts of this entire event. Was, and and was in Rob that moment, that. in that moment, John Rob does not know who's putting well and who's not. He just knows he hasn't made a single putt and he's losing and he's losing ground. And he's just saying, well, it must be a putting contest. That's well, the way that the, I see it. And the, okay. So you got Tom Hoagie, uh, Hodges, and that's just round four, producer Jacob. Go to the entire event. So Hoagie Hodges well, and, and only two Zalatoris. days were, were counted strokes gain wise though. Totally fair. And I think that's the other part where it's like the point that I'm making is offset a little bit by the fact that you're only counting two rounds. The bigger picture thing with the ROM deal is the best players want the hardest setups, right? Like because the things that they excel at, T to green, get rewarded by really difficult setups. It's a this is a pro like if you don't if you want hard setups you can't play in events that are pro amps right like you can't don't you can't play in this it's not going to be a like the most difficult setup of the year so i don't know there's a lot of different stuff there good for hudson swafford uh he got called harris english on the broadcast which is freaking hilarious it's almost become ironic and yet it still like continues to happen and uh yeah this was fun sunday very fun Sunday, but we did not do very well in one and done, which I guess is good for the top of the board. We'll get there in just one second. Sina Jad, 983,000. He added to his total because he went with Justin Rose, T33, but he remains down in last place. KP, you have snapped through the million dollar mark because of the T25 from Scotty Scheffler. Scheffler got you $55,000. I think you were probably hoping for more. Yeah, disappointing, but I'm glad that I didn't take Cantlay or Rom. You know, that that was yeah. that was on my mind to do that. And that would have been that would have been really disappointing. So I, I'm yeah, it's not great, but I'm I'm okay with it. Three whiffs in a row. Greg with Corey Connors, myself with Matthew Wolf, producer Jacob with Ricky Fowler. We all remain the same. Greg, you burned Corey Connors which I think was only one bad round. I think he got started off bad on Thursday, played yeah. much better on Friday. Oh, he didn't play all that great on Saturday either. But uh, this is this is the biggest surprise to me, quite frankly. I'm not surprised Ricky Fowler missed the cut. I'm certainly not surprised Matthew Wolf missed the cut. I think I came on here and said he might finish first, he might finish last. We knew those guys were volatile. Corey Connors has been piling top 25s. Um, that That to me was probably one of the bigger surprises of the week. Well, it's probably a mistake to pick Corey Connors in a putting contest. <laughs> yeah, what were you doing? You should have talked to John Rom. <laughs> right, I should have talked to John Rom. But look, this is the hard thing about this event this week. You're not going to pick Hudson Swafford in your one and done. You're and Tom Hoagie, maybe, but it, probably just me. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, there aren't a lot of. I was going to say, why would times you're going to play Tom Hoagie? And, why would and, you pick Hoagie over Swafford? You, you you wouldn't pick either of those guys because you'd never use those guys in a one, in a one and done. Right. I mean, they're they're very. It's very unlikely that you're going to play them in one and done. So I think Kyle makes a great point. You're glad you didn't play Cantlay or I mean, I, I guess Will Zalatoris would be yeah looking at the board. Zalatoris would have been like the best, most logical pick that you could have gotten to because he was right. one of the top five or six favorites. He finished T six. That that would have been like the objectively best, most logical play you could have made. But are you going to play Will Zalatoris in a putting contest? Well, I think that I think the answer to that is is uh, Siwoo. I think Siwoo, Siwoo would, have, would have been the best, most logical. I mean, Siwoo, shaking that ass, shaking that ass, shaking that ass. <laughs> Based on the uh, – I mean, I, I always forget about just he's so good on Pete Dye courses, right? Players crazy. here. Uh, he played well at uh, – were Harbor was it Harbor Town that he almost won? I think so. Yeah, I think it was Harbor. Remember he just, where he almost made two aces in the same day at Wyndham? He his like his like par three proximity. I think it was at Sedgefield was like six total feet or something outrageous. <laughs> he just destroys on Pete Dye courses. So that that would have been I don't know. Maybe I regret that, but not really. I still I still like the. I like the Corey Connors pick too. It was a good pick. Yeah, it just it um it, it hurts to get zero out of him because he's gonna have some nice weeks. But yeah. this isn't the week to be playing a the good players miss the cut in this kind of week. It happens every year, every tournament like this. Really good players will miss the cut, and there's not much explanation for it. It's just it's easy to it's really easy to miss the cut this week. 
so um yeah i'm i'm uh, like disappointed but i'll sleep fine tonight <laughs> Corey connors needs to win by the way he never wins is he on the short list of well, guys who need to win most well by our I mean, standards not by like real standards he's yeah, never going mean, to monday qualify again so that that might make it hard for him if you're a uh if you're a top 15 ball striker like that you gotta you gotta win same with Scheffler, honestly. Scheffler, Connor, Zalatoris. That's the short list of guys that like we need we think they need to win. They probably don't, but I, well, I put Scheffler well, uh, on top of that list. Connors has won. Right. Valero a couple two, years ago. Yeah, the other two have, have not. But yeah, Connors just doesn't he doesn't win enough for somebody who hits it that that well. The coach got $55,000 from Scotty Scheffler, same as Kyle, so he remains in second. Mark, you used Tony Finau, T40, $27,000. Uh, you, you used Tony Finau. We can discuss the merits of that and how you feel, but you just you just dodged a huge bullet here by, by everybody else uh, who we were all basically on different guys. There was a lot of bullets for you to dodge, and you have dodged them all. Yeah, I sort of did. Uh, and the truth be told, um, at one stage he was looking like a firm miscut there and he had a fast finish um, on Saturday evening to make the cut on the number. And then today we covered him in feature groups coverage and, you know, he didn't get the job. He, he got the John Rahm memo that it, he didn't get the memo that it was a putting contest. I mean, hit the thing fine. It's just putted horribly the entire week. And yeah, could I, could you call it a wasted pick? Sure. But, you know, it's 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 one week down. The thing, the, the thing now is just to try and make solid picks, in my opinion. Uh, the, the truth of it all is, for me, I've always struggled with picking golfers through California. All the Californian events, they're so hard to handicap. You know, this one with a three-round cut in a pro-am format um, on three different courses. Torrey Pines, Riviera, Pebble on Poanea Greens. Yeah, you have your usual suspects that play well over there, but, you know, you start missing a few four- and five-footers because the ball's bouncing around the place. You know they'll get headless as well. So, so, so this little stretch of golf for me is just sort of get through unscathed as far as possible, and then hopefully make some hay when you get down to the Florida courses and beyond. Yeah, it is a it is a tough portion of the schedule to try to predict our best bets as a group. We split them. KP, you had Matthew Wolf over Abraham Answer. That did not go your way. Greg, Yikes. you had Michael Thompson over Ricky Fowler and Russell Henley. That did not go your way. No. I, I mean, listen, Michael Thompson played great last week, did not play great this week. And KP, Matthew Wolf, uh, I think you knew what you were getting yourself into. And uh, we got bad Wolf. Sometimes you get really good Wolf and he's locked in and he can't miss. Not this week. Yeah, that was, that was fine. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the volatility and you're just kind of betting on that. I, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to make of him. Like, I, I don't, I just don't know. And that's, I guess, sort of the point, but I, I just don't know what to expect for the rest of the year. It's not, I don't know. It's very up and down. I like the three ball, Greg. I like the three ball that you tried to pull off here. The plus two twenty five didn't work. It was but... a great number. Yeah. And look, Thompson could have, he, he could have, he, he's a great fit for this golf course. He just got off to a terrible start on Thursday. And, um, and he played. He fought hard, but you you can't shoot. He shot what five over on Thursday. Shot a seventy seven. Yeah. 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 You're done. You're done after that. I mean, shave the beard after that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry. Oh boy. Tough crowd here. Uh, well, I got a Greg. I got a couple of winners. So I went with Patrick Cantlay over John Rob. I was scared. All week long, that cash plus 130. And Mark, you are now two and one in your nationality bets. This one, Christian Bezadenhout, low South African, plus 110. And there was not much of a sweat here. You, this, was, this was pretty easy for you. I think I said so. I, I looked at that bet there as the low South African with love to Dylan. Um, and I was like, this is probably the easiest bet in the world. And, and you got positive uh, positive odds out of that I, I jumped on that thing over there and i wasn't at all surprised in fact i was a little more surprised that Poseidon didn't finish better than what he did because the game looked real sound i, I chatted with his caddy um you know during the week and he goes nah, he's playing nicely and um he just you know didn't finish it off really today 
He was the only South African to make the cut, so you did not even sweat the final rounds like we usually do when we get these matchups. And there was a, okay, so there was a Seamus Power. I wanted to check this. Caesars had a Seamus Power Russell Henley matchup. Okay, it did. They pushed. Seamus Power entered with a seven shot lead on Sunday in that Caesars matchup. Shot a 74, two over. Russell Henley, 67, Greg. That's a seven-shot swing for a push. That seems to always be what happens. Oh, yeah. Not an easy no sweat with, with a couple of You know, it makes it fun to watch, right? Um, <laughs> what, a, what a round for Henley. And what a tournament. Because he struggles here. Um, yeah. Or has in the past. He, he does not have great history. And coming off of a, an emotional loss last week, he got right back on the horse. So, yeah, he, he's in good form and um, tough day for Seamus Power. But this is Henley's best finish at this event, T14. Okay, gentlemen, we, we got more. Lots of golf going on. So, Abu Dhabi, we got to talk about that. And then we've got to talk about someone named Aaron Jarvis that Kyle Porter yes. is going to give us lots of new information on. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. And we're back. All right, across the pond, some big names Abu Dhabi. Thomas Peters gets it done. He becomes not only the first Belgian to win a Rolex Series event, Kyle, but he now claims his sixth DP World Tour title. I got to get used to saying that. It's the new year. Sixth DP World Tour title. What is the current perception of Thomas Peters, right? Because I think for so long, we were like, look, look at Thomas Peters. He's got this upside. He's got this game. Then he kind of disappears for a little bit. Now he's won twice in 77 days. Like, what's the current perception on Thomas Peters? Well, I I think it's I, I forgot who said this on Twitter, but I thought it was correct. It might have been been uh Dan Rappaport over at uh, at Golf Digest. I think a little I don't know if underachieving is the right word, but under accomplished. Like like Thomas Peters should be on Ryder Cup teams. You know, he, he is in that sort of, I think he's younger than Danny Willett, but like just, you, you know, in that kind of Willett range of like, man, you guys should be like the next generation of, of European Ryder Cuppers. And it hasn't, it hasn't like panned out like that, you know? And, and so I think it's, it's, you look at him winning once or twice a year on the European tour. Can we just call it that? Do we have to call it the DP World Tour? Yes. Rick, You'll you're on mute. It. You're on mute. Oh, man. I hate when I that do was, that. Yeah. Uh, tough. Uh, I mean, I was going to say they're not paying us, but Mark said, yes, we have to say it. Yeah, well, the <laughs> DP, DP are paying for that name. So, yes, we got to. Let's be respectful. <laughs> what, to who? I don't care about uh, what, what is What does DP have to do with my life? They're the DP you world. You never know. It's like the it's like, calling, like we don't we don't call it the AT and T Pebble being Pebble Beach Links Pro whatever. We just call it Pebble. Yeah, I do. Do we call it the Memorial presented by Mastercard? No, I think it's nationwide, isn't it? <laughs> I think yes, uh, Mastercard is, is the Arnold Palmer of it. No, yeah. it's work. No, no, no. See, that's Mark's hotel internet knowing it was a bad take and just cutting him right <laughs> off. <laughs> so Thomas Peters should be winning at least once a year on on the European tour. Like uh, 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 maybe not winning, but like contending. Like this should be kind of where he's at. My second take on that event, and this is like you can't manufacture this, but man, the wind and the weather coming yeah. into effect, it – it's kind of sweet. Like they were hitting some shots. I saw Rory said on Sunday, he's like, I haven't hit a full iron in like all week. I've been hitting knockdowns and it's like, it's shot making. It's like what the best are the best at. And that's, that's fun to watch. And I think it, uh, I mean, you saw the top, top of the board there is Peters. It was Havel and Rory kind of made a mini run on, on Sunday where he got within three. Um, Cabrera Hatton, Bay yeah. is a, a, a good player. Hatton's up there. So it just, it, Adam Scott top 10 it just makes for I think really quality and, and interesting golf to watch on TV yeah I saw a couple of times Greg a guy would be like addressing his ball the wind would be kicking up they'd take off their hat hand it to the caddy and then have to hit the shot without a hat on because the wind was yeah. the wind was kicking like that it's it's a good test 10 under par was the winning score and this is yeah, I mean, this is a good field. They're going to get another good field next week, too. These these points are important, obviously. Um, 
I know it's early in the year. I know this is like basically their first or second event, but uh, this starts to shape up that 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 race towards the the finals. Yeah, um, but you know what the other cool thing was about this event? Um, you had Scott Jameson shoot nine under on day one, yeah, and ten under wins. So it just tells it it turned so much yeah. into into Friday and made for a really really interesting event. And uh, I want to also point out on um, on Peters, he won in he won the Portugal Masters in November. Mm-hmm. So he's I, I feel like he's kind of coming into back into form. And after Ryder Cup, we were also high on him. He lost his game. I, I think you're going to see his achievement kind of round out a little bit. And I agree with what Kyle was saying about what his expectations are. I, I think you're going to see that come to life. Um, cause he is really good and he, mm-hmm. he just, he lost his game and it happens. So I, I'm, I'm rather excited to see what he does cause he, he belongs on me too. He belongs on Ryder cup teams. I couldn't agree more. He, he's also 29 Mark. So it's not like we're, you know, he's got plenty of, uh, yeah. plenty of years, plenty of game left six time winner on that circuit. I mean, this is hopefully we hear more and more about him. Well, that was what I was going to add, and then I wanted to add too. You know, the one thing about Peters is he's got a little John Rahm in him where he can run hot like in the blink of an eye. That boy will go from zero to volcanic, and you know, after one golf swing. And and in many respects, that sometimes gets in his way because unlike a Woods or some of these great winners who had tempers, who can hit the bad shot, just blow their lid, and then be fully focused and singular on the next one, Peters tends to take it with him. And at that level, when you're competing against that guy, those those guys and that talent, you can't afford to be hitting shots without 100% focus or shots where you're living in something that's happened. So if he starts to let the game come to him, I, I feel like he'll start to fulfill the physical potential that he's shown because he is special. I mean, the way he hits it is, is so, so pretty. Um, but he's going to have to just learn, okay, golf is an, an imperfect game played in an imperfect environment. I'm going to hit bad shots at times. I'm going to have to survive at times and then thrive. And when things aren't going my way, I can't just be just throwing the toys out the cot because then I'm actually, I, I'm I'm losing strokes because I'm handing strokes to other folks with that mindset and mentality. Mm. Good stuff. Handing strokes to other folks. I like that. That was um, catchy. Yeah, that I like very that. catchy. KP, yeah. you have an article. Yeah on cbssports.com right now about an amateur, his name's Aaron Jarvis, who just secured his spot in the Masters and the Open Championship. And this is kind of a story that uh, should be told, should be heard. It's incredible. I mean, so Aaron Jarvis, a freshman at UNLV, is 19 years old, from the Cayman Islands, population 71,000, so a Mm. third of Augusta. It's a third as big as Augusta, Georgia. Wow. Which is not which is not that big. Um he's ranked 1,669 in the world, but that's among amateurs. That's not like in the official world golf rankings. That's <laughs> that's in the the WAGR, the world amateur golf rankings. He's played seven college rounds at UNLV. Seven. Never broken, he's never been better than 72 in any of those seven rounds. He had, he had a quote after he wins the Latin America Amateur Championship where he said, you know, I got that experience at UNLV and I just came in with a lot of confidence uh, to this event. And I was like, you, you've played seven rounds and you haven't, <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't shot in the 60s yet. Like none, none of your rounds have been in the 60s. Uh, I think you have confidence because you're 19 and you play college golf, not because you've had a lot of good experience at UNLV. Uh, his last three wins include the uh, CIGA, I think that's Cayman Islands Golf Association, Christmas Match Play Invitational, Got the South guys. Florida Junior Open, which I think is actually a big deal, and the 54-hole Junior Open at Celebration. No idea what that is. He was the co-winner. They didn't have a playoff. They just declared co-winners. And now he's going to be playing in the 2022 Masters with Rory, Rom, and Dustin Johnson, and the 2022 open championship at the old course in July. So it's, it's really an unbelievable story that the 1,669th ranked amateur in the world 
who's beating guys that were ranked in the top 50 at this tournament is going to be playing in the Masters and the Open Championship. It's 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 cool that those that the the that Augusta National and the RNA give invites to to guys that to to players that win amateurs uh, amateur events like this. And it's just a cool story to be 19 to play at Augusta. You're you're from a you're from a country that's got 27 holes on the entire island. Not like there's one place that has like like there's only 27 holes on the island that he that you you grow up playing. And now he's in the Masters and and the Open. So a really cool story out of the uh, the Latin America Amateur Championship. You know, it's probably pretty competitive because everybody knows there's 27 holes. And it's like, there's no secrets out there. I know. Right? Like and when you're playing against your buddies, like there's no secrets. There's no home. There's no home course advantage. It's everybody's course. There's nowhere to go either. It's not like, oh, well, these guys play over here. You got to beat everybody that's right there. And that's kind of what happened at, at this event. Also, he, uh, he had, there's a great video of him. So he makes a bunch of birdies and then closes out his uh, front nine on Sunday. Bogey double. And then he makes a bunch of birdies and he hits one in the water on 16. It looked like it was, he was cooked. Like it was over. He makes like a 35 footer that he walks in mm -hmm. on 16 for bogey birdies. The last to get into the masters and the open championship. It was, it was pretty awesome. It was, it was really, I mean, just a cool life moment for him. I mean, he may or may not go on to play professional golf, but uh, just one that uh, <laughs> he'll certainly remember for a long time. How can you not be romantic about golf, Mark? How only only in golf does stuff like this happen, right? Uh, golf is the greatest, man. It'll drive you batty. It's it, it's it's the coolest sport that is so difficult, and we love it, and it drives us bananas. But stories like that bring tears to my eyes because I mean, you're looking at a guy and me that if it wasn't for golf, I wouldn't be on a call with you guys. I I, I don't have many other skills, and I come from a little town outside of Cape Town that's smaller than Augusta, Georgia, and I get to call the masters so it's yeah it's special and and i love the fact that the the masters club and the rna have respect the latin american am enough as they do with the asian pacific amateur um to allow the amateurs into the event because that was bob jones's wish um and i think it was a worthwhile move because the public links champion used to get in there and that tournament was obviously disbanded by the usga and that's how tim clark from south africa my brother got into masters as an amateur from the public links. So now to make this thing global, which the golf, which the game of golf is, I, I think it's just tremendous. Yeah. 71,000 population of the Cayman Islands, Greg, UNLV student population alone, like 29,000. Now he's going, he's getting a lot of experience in those seven events, probably a little bit of culture shock. Also going to get a ton of experience. I just think like, what's that leap going to be, right? I mean, he goes from the events that Kyle listed off uh, to playing at Augusta National to playing at Think the old course. The like, come on. like, could you have handpicked like two yeah. better spots on the planet? No, no, you couldn't. If you could play in any two majors, that, that would probably, that would very likely be it. Um, I, I think those would be one and two, but um, I think about what it's going to be like when he goes back to UNLV. And if mm -hmm. you've played seven rounds at your car, you're not the star of the team. You're not the guy everybody expects to be playing in the masters, but boy, your, your, your respect level with your, with your buds on, on the team just went through the roof and they're, you're, they're going to look at you a little different now, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Um, because the, the, the college golf team, while they're close, when somebody on your team does something like that, it's, it's special and, and, um, and really unique. So I'd be, I'd be excited for him. And think about the coach, the coach at UNLV, right? If he's, how, how do you sit him? How do you, I mean, he's got to play. He's going to play in the, he's going to play in the masters. I'll tell you one thing's for certain. These college teammates who probably didn't, if there was anyone who didn't like him, they're becoming fast friends because oh, yeah. there's tickets in the future over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave, leave some tickets that will call for me, please. Yeah, Thank exactly. you very much. Uh, all right, gentlemen, I think that'll do it. Danielle Kang won on the LPGA. Vegas yeah. Golf, Morikawa, Xander, Danielle Kang. Aaron Jones, Jupiter Rick West. Damon. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite as decorated yet, but I'll, I'll work on that. Um, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Big week next week. I'm excited. Okay, let's Big talk week. about this. Yeah, so next week is Wednesday. 
to Saturday, which obviously means the programming is going to be a little bit different. We'll do our DFS preview normal time, 2.30 or no, 5.30 Eastern Monday. And producer Jacob, we are going early for the mega preview. Is that going to be live or are we recording that? Uh, plan is to go live. And okay. We will be on location, at least some of the crew. Yep. Yeah, we're going to be all over the place next week. So, KP, where you you and Jacob and are going to be at what, the PGA show? Yeah, we'll be at the PGA show in Orlando on okay. starting like Monday night. And there's always or, good stuff there. You always get you always get to like do uh there's like a scooter, you know, there's a scooter there. simulators, you know. It's yeah. all the stuff that's fun for like the first two days. And yeah. then you're sitting there on Friday. By Friday you're like Okay, I think I I think I understand like what the equipment's gonna look like this year. <laughs> bring us bring us home some sweet swag that you yeah. Get. The simulator stuff is awesome. Like we by Friday you're just like, you know, pounding out eighteen holes as fast as you can. It's it's <laughs> it's super fun. So we had that, a, uh, I think last time around we we had some closest to the pen contest with our, our friends at Supreme Golf. Yeah, yeah, we were play, we were playing the old course on the simulator, uh, which was which was awesome so you don't, even, don't even have to make the trip it'll be yeah i, I would rather make the trip uh <laughs> it will be uh it'll be fun just to, i haven't seen producer jacob in what two years so it'll be fun just to just to get together mark you and i will be at tory pines we will i travel out there wednesday morning um get there some to that stage at late afternoon and then uh it's pre preparation thursday and show friday uh, afternoon um yeah, Friday, Saturday, week or weekend because of the AFC Championship Sunday. So looking forward to it. I love Torrey Pines. I, I think the South Course is a brute. It's always going to, uh, you know, beat folks up a little bit. And if you're up for that sort of stuff uh, as a golf fan, it's it's a good tournament to watch. The view is unreal. It's unbelievable. So we'll be piecing it together remotely. Greg, where will you be next week? Right there? I I'll be, yeah, right here. Um very most likely i'll be right here i'm not traveling anywhere Beautiful. um course record the picture you see behind me that starts tomorrow our first episode of oh, season three that's right. um so we'll be we'll be busy with that rolling on um and then yeah a lot going on here with you guys and it, it should be it should be a nice week but i'll be in my usual one of my usual spots round by round recaps are wednesday thursday friday saturday because we're not going to compete with that little sport they call football. We will not compete with them. Um, but otherwise, I think that'll do it, gentlemen. Producer Jacob does all the hard work behind the scenes. Greg Ducharme, he's available on Twitter at TheRealGFD. That's Mark Immelman, at Mark underscore Immelman. Kyle Porter, at Kyle Porter CBS. And you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been The First Cut, and we'll catch you next time.